With us now is Morris Dees, co-founder and former chief trial counsel for the Southern Poverty Law Center based in Montgomery, Alabama, to discuss Donald versus United Clans of America. Welcome, Mr. Dees. Glad to be here. This, this case is uh, important because it involves a, a lynching of a, an innocent black teenager in 1981 in Mobile, Alabama, by two members of the United Clans of America, a pretty dangerous group that had chapters at the time in some 25 states. This lynching came about because another African-American or black man was on trial in Mobile for killing a white police officer. And the jury that was selected for the trial involved 10 blacks and two whites. And the Klan kind of watched this trial because uh, it was, they wanted to make sure this, this black man was convicted. And as they watched the trial, they came up with a plan. Look, if the jury doesn't convict this black man, then we're gonna, we're gonna go out and we're gonna kill a black person in such a way that when blacks sit on juries in the future, and if it involves the interests of white people, they better be careful. So the United Clans of America picked two of their members, uh, Henry Hayes and Tiger Knowles, James Knowles, and they gave them a gun and a rope and a car. And so they watched the trial during the week it went on. And the jury came back with a, a not guilty verdict. They didn't convict the man. And so they decided they would, would put this plan in action. So these two young Klansmen went out and drove around the streets of Mobile until they found Michael Donnell, who was 19 years old. He was working as a clerk in the Mobile Press Register while he was in school. And so they, they got him in the car and they, they he didn't know why they were getting him, but they took him across the Bayou Bridge over into another county and beat him up and hit him and cut his throat and put a rope around his neck and brought him back and hung him in a tree in uh, a pretty much mixed black and white neighborhood in, in Mobile. Well, it, it took about two and a half years before the FBI finally was able to make arrest of, of Hayes and Knowles and uh, they did get convict both of them. And I went to the criminal trial and watched Mrs. Donald, uh, who had several children, Michael was one of her, was her youngest son. She didn't go to the trial because she was very upset about the time, but her family members did. And we watched uh, uh, James Tiger Knowles, who cut a deal with the FBI and decided that, that he would plead guilty for really intimidating black jurors if they served on any trials in the future, they better be careful. And, uh, and he got a life sentence in the Federal Witness Protection Program. But he was a star witness against Henry Hayes, who was about 20 years old at the time, for what he did in, in lynching of, of Michael Donald. And I watched the case, and uh, as I looked at the case, I thought, gosh, you know, uh, I didn't agree with the district attorney after the jury convicted Hayes and gave him the death penalty, unfortunately, something we personally don't agree with, but that's what the jury did. And I was, I said, well, you know, I know the United Clans of America. And, and quite honestly, they were very strong back in the 1950s and 60s, but pretty much it died out. And, uh, and I wasn't too familiar with hate groups. The Southern Poverty Law Center, where I worked, didn't sue hate groups. We did other kinds of litigation. And so we did a little, little check-in. I got the Justice Department to allow me to go talk to uh, Knowles and we had a, got a good relationship going and he began to tell me a story that was quite unbelievable. Well, it turned out that this Klan group in Mobile was just one of the many units of the United Clans of America. And they had, as I said, in some 25 states. And at that meeting, they, they, had, they had a plan that if this man got off uh, killing this white police officer, they were gonna get a, a person and go out and we were gonna kill us a black person to send a message. And, uh, and so I, I decided, well, gosh, you know, you can't, you can't sue a hate group. Uh, you know, in America, you have the freedom of speech and they can talk negative against all kinds of people like many other groups do, but you can sue a group if you can show that leaders of the group, somebody in an official capacity 
organized and conspired to cause this lynching to take place. And uh, historically, no hate group had ever been sued successfully before a jury, never even been sued because it, it was always the individuals who, who did the act. Uh, the United Clans of America, I knew it, bombed the church in Birmingham and, and killed those four little girls. And three Klansmen were later convicted, but not the United Clans of America, who actually was, they were members of it. And then Vala Uzo was killed on the march from Selma to Montgomery, a Michigan African, a white woman who came down to help in that protest. And the Freedom Riders, they were, they were beaten up by members of the United Clan, but nobody sued the United Clan. It was just individual members that got, got caught. So we, we decided, gosh, let's bring a civil suit. And lawyers at the Southern Poverty Law Center told me, they said, Maury, you know, you're not the most educated lawyer we have here. And guys that worked for us went to Harvard and Yale and other great schools, but they said, you know, you got a problem. You got to show a conspiracy by official clan leaders. We had two pretty good investigators who got out and worked hard and they found the evidence that we really needed. Obviously we had the Mobile group and we had one clan official there. Uh, Henry Hayes, the guy who was convicted, his daddy was an official of the clan, the second highest official in Alabama. And he had encouraged lynching and had chosen the two people. But we wanted to do more than that. We found uh, another guy who was in the Klan Witness Protection Program and it was difficult to get him and we found him. And he talked about Klan leaders encouraging he and 13 other Klan members to bomb a home that a black NAACP resident lived in in 1979. And then we also found a, a, the guy who was in the car, a United Klan member when Viola Luzo was killed. And, he, and we found him, he was in the Witness Protection Program it quite frankly took a lot of work to find these people that you're not supposed to be able to find, but we found him and he was a star witness saying that the actual head of the United Clans of America actually had encouraged some violent actions. So we took these people to trial in, in Mobile in a federal court. The criminal trial was in a state court, but this is a federal court. And we had a, an all white jury there and it was, uh, and we had sued the, the Klansmen that did these acts and the leaders and official of the Klan and their lawyer was there to protect them. And we put on our case and unfortunately, you know, Henry Hayes had gone around and told a few people what he had done before he got caught. And that was pretty, pretty damning evidence. And we had other good important stuff. In fact, we found a photograph in a United Klan newspaper showing a, a black man that says when blacks ask for some complain about things, this is what you do to him. You turn the page and you can see him hanging from a tree. And that was published in 1979 or 80. And uh, Hayes, who was my star witness in, this, in the civil case, turned out to be a wonderful witness and, a, and in the end, a wonderful guy. He was only 17 years old when this took place. And so, so we uh, uh, ended up uh, uh, with the trial and we had a, a, a you know, about a week's trial and it was, a, it was a good case. And we had an African-American lawyer, Michael Figures there representing the, uh, uh, the, the whole thing. And, and you know, and, and I may have misspoken, but it was Tiger Knowles who was a star witness. I may, may have said, hey, time has passed here, yeah. but he was a star witness. And he ended up uh, getting a, a, a chance to be on the stand. Ms. Donald was sitting there with, in front of the jury and she said, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to sit here because I now have the courage to face those people that killed my son. And Hayes got on the stand and testified what happened. And I guess this, um, pardon me, again, I said, Hayes, time passes us here. <laughs> and uh, uh, Knowles got on the stand and said, you know, Ms. Donald, I'm sorry for what happened to your son. Time has passed and I'm so regretful, but, I, but I'm just so sorry. And she looked at him in front of that jury and said, well, son, I've already forgiven you. Well, that jury came in with a $7 million verdict. And it ended up that the Klan's national headquarters in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, 
and its new 10,000 square foot building was deeded to Mrs. Donald because that case bankrupted the United Clans of America. And, you know, it was over and the group was gone and the chapters in 25 states were out of the way. But we were seeing uh, in the late 19, early 1980s and late 1970s, right? We saw, you know, a lot of other hate groups going around the country. And now that we had this successful way of suing an organization, we brought 12 additional suits all the way up into to the year 2002, all across the country in Idaho, in Oregon, in uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, all around the country, suing groups like the Aryan Nations in Idaho, the White People's Republic Party out in Oregon and California. And we got multi-million dollar judgments all over the country. And that, that kind of is a, a legacy of this case. Ms. Donald was a brave woman to come forward and to put her life on the line with the Klan there. And she wasn't looking for money, even though she did get a, a home after we sold the Klan's property, which is a wonderful home. And now, now she's deceased and passed away. But she wanted to make sure that no other mother had to suffer what she suffered. And these groups that we put out of business actually were the only land-based groups that had money and people came and trained to do violence in the United States. Today, we only have, you know, internet groups and none of them have any property and none of them have any money. They're just more or less sounding boards. And obviously things come from those groups that cause violence, but not like it was in the days of the United Klan. This was probably the, I'm sure, the most significant case that I've ever done and one of the most important cases that the Southern Poverty Law Center has ever done.